All right, gentlemen, good morning. Thanks so much for jumping on. Good morning. Good morning, Dan. For those of you listening along, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dan Payne, the president of the CCC BUA. I've got Ricardo Rodriguez, one of our board members, and also our guest today is Coach Bob Kittle. Bob, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's awesome to have you, man. Um, one of the things, Bob, we've had a chance to work together for a lot of years. And of course, you're a longtime guy at Cabrillo College over in Aptos. And um, with your transition out of Cabrillo at the end of last season, uh, we had some really good conversations in the off season. I couldn't believe how many of our veteran umpires were coming to me wondering, what's Bob going to do next? Bob's such a great guy. We love working with him. Uh, is he going to coach again? What's he going to do? And then you and I had some dialogue around maybe paying a little bit more attention to helping us with uh, umpire improvement. So um, now you've landed on uh, something new. Tell us what's up for 2023. Yeah, it's been a great opportunity. Rick Wayne's here at West Valley. Asked if I asked him if I can come on board and come on board at West Valley. It's just a great environment. I'm really happy to be here. It's the best thing I've done coaching so far. Like Dan was saying earlier, Bob, you and I, is, I've also had a chance to uh, have a few conversations often during the, the fall ball, during the evaluation process with our recruits. When you um, observe umpires, when you're looking at not just prospects, but game time, regular season, late season, postseason, what are you looking at? What are strengths that you recognize that you're looking for in, a, in an umpire um, out on the field? You know, I think the number one is presence. Not a cocky presence, but not an unsure presence. Um, and, and that's really important. And, and to go with that presence is assurance when you're making a call. No uncertainty, uh, committing to what you, you make as a call, and not being too stubborn to get the call right. I think Dan and I have had that conversation before. The umpire's job is to get the call right. You know, So uh, it's OK to if they make a mistake and confer and get it right. But that confidence in, in giving the right call and no hesitation, it helps. And then the third thing would be being verbal, you know, very loud. Foul ball, don't just assume it, say it. Um, if you'll fly, nice and loud, hand up. Those are all combined together that, that, that the coaches and players appreciate as well. The NCAA has given us some tools to help get calls right. Uh, do you find that they are underutilized? Do you see that you have to push too hard to get uh, – umpires to come together what's your been what's been you know, your experience our experience has been that for the most part if all the umpires are on the same page that we want to get the call right it's so it happens i think some coaches abuse it and try to overutilize that and and that's part of that confidence of an umpire like no that's the call but for the most part i think the tool has been used properly what are you looking at as uh, one of the differences that a young uh, developing umpire can do to uh, improve their presence and their command on the field? Uh, I think trying not to be overly assertive is one okay. one error that we'll see sometimes like it is my field, shoulders back, almost looking for competition. The other one is just being uncertain on calls, quiet, oh. uh, not committing to it, or having to explain or ask in between innings. We had a recent game and um, I came out to talk about something between innings and I'm probably, hey, I missed that call. So that, that call is over. You know, you don't have to explain it to me. That's okay. You know, let's move forward. So there's both sides of it. And it is experience. It is experience. Give me an idea of uh, where you see uh, improvement coming from. Is it just from the on-field stuff? Is there rule book knowledge? Where, where, uh, where would be the most immediate growth that you would see to get, to get our uh, staff uh, up to speed? I think rule book knowledge is always the most important thing. I mean, that's okay. paramount to being a successful umpire is to know the rule book uh, and, and understand that most of the coaches do not know the rule book, uh, although they claim to. So right. rule, rule book knowledge is certainly paramount. And in positioning, I mean, guys hustling to get in position. I've seen you guys train and, and I believe uh, some guys don't get in position. And for me as a coach, if a guy makes a call and he's out of position, uh, that's infuriating. You know, that, that's just straight hustle. It takes no ability to hustle. And, and that would be, I think, the other part, just being in position. And you guys train it. I've watched you train. I mean, that's a huge part of how to do it, how to set up as an umpire behind the plate, how to get out there for fly balls and where your position is on the bases. I mean, those are two big areas. Good. 
Good. Well, we uh, it's a process, as you know. Um, you've seen it from the from the beginning when we're out there. We've got a handful of new prospects, and of course, uh, you've been on the postseason field as well. So, you've seen um, you've seen it develop, and sometimes develop over over time, over years. Right. Right. Um, so it it is um, it doesn't just happen. I've I've had this conversation before with others. You don't just snap your finger and get a new umpire up to speed. It, it takes some growth, maybe a little bit of stress, and then some development to come back uh, and growth on top of that. So um, I, I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you sharing your, your thoughts on the subject. You know, I think that fall training when you guys do all the fall games is, yeah. is really how you're going to expedite it and speed it up. And I love when we said you and Gavlin with my travel team. Yeah, and yeah, so. you were working those guys, and but they were learning, and it was good to have conversations with the coaches as well. And we talked to that one guy, I remember, about yep. his presence, yep. you know, yep. and the other guy about being in position. Um, that's where they're going to speed up. And, and you guys are nicer training them too. And back in the old days, it was like a boot camp. So I appreciate that. You um, and I, you were mentioning uh, Gavlin when we were together out there. Um, you were able to share some of your thoughts about, uh, you know, you're an old school uh, coach. You, you, you know, run things by the book and things are changing in, in uh, baseball, changing on the rules, changing in timing. How um, do you, as a coach, adapt to the new um, protocols they have for us? Uh, the biggest one this year is that 22nd clock. How is that affecting how you see umpires work? Well, I'm happy you brought that up because obviously everyone's struggling with that call. Um, I believe it's a good rule that's unnecessary. Uh, we're rarely going over 20 seconds. We haven't had it too often. The problem has been enforcement. So what we've done at West Valley is uh, before every game, when the umpires come meet us, we just discuss how they're going to implement the 20 second rule because it's been different in nine straight games. And I know it's constantly evolving. So I think, Something that'll help all the coaches is at, at the home plate meeting is that that's one of the discussions. Here's how we're going to enforce the 20 second rule. Because then we won't have any problems during the game. Because it has been across the board. And I don't, I, I think it's an unnecessary rule for our level. There's very few teams that need it. Uh, we go pretty quick. We're never going to get the shot clocks that make it even easier. But right. it's not, I don't think it's that impactful. It has not impacted in any of our games. So. Uh, Bob, one thing I want to come back to is talking a little bit about intangibles. So we've talked about preseason and working out the kinks. That's part of every year. But as we get down the stretch and in the conference play and you start feeling confident about the type of umpires you'd want to see on the field in the postseason, can you talk a little more? I know we talked about presence, but what else in terms of intangibles? What really separates and, and gives you some confidence that uh, you're going to get a fair game? And, and what does good look like from the officiating perspective down the stretch? A consistent, a consistent strike zone is always paramount to any any coach wants a consistent strike zone. And, and for me and, our, and all coaches, we want a strike zone that's not too high and not too wide. And I know you guys get instructed a lot for different types of strike zones, but what's good for baseball is just a good, honest strike zone that's consistent. And that's the intangible for any umpire, for any coach, for any umpire. And then consistency on the bases. I mean, base umpires – it's about being a position and that's, that's all it takes. I mean, those are the two intangibles and then knowledge of the, of the rule book. You know, we, we want to make sure everything's right. And as we were talking the other day, I was talking to Bob about it. The best umpire crew we have is when no one has any idea who was umpiring. And that means we had it right. You know, that means you guys got it right. Awesome. Awesome. And if I could ask for a little perspective, so you've been in different, um, coaching capacities on the field. So whether you're in the dugout or if you're coaching a base, can you give us a little perspective on what you're looking at strike zone wise? Obviously a little different vantage point behind the catcher as it is, you know, from a dugout or, or maybe even under more of a diagonal angle at third base. What, what are you looking for? Well, it was interesting when I watched your guys' training at Skyline and how we, and it would be good for coaches to have a better perspective on how umpires are supposed to set up behind the dish. And now I understand a little bit more why there's more drop me catchers because it gives more of an, a tunnel for your umpires. So positioning is number one, where the umpire is behind, behind the catcher. And then number two is um, 
not exactly going with the catcher, but staying inside the parameters. You know, for me, my parameters would be um, belly button to the top of the knees and maybe a couple inches off on each side. That, that's a strike zone that most coaches are going to be okay with. And from the side, you know, if a guy's cross-handing a ball for a strike or he's set up way outside and, and it, guy has good command, he's getting a strike, but it's way outside, those are ish, those would be the issues that we look for. Okay. And would have complaints with. Okay, great. Yeah, some of the feedback that we've gotten really uh, the last couple of years have been about the width and how you really can't expect a kid to be hitting a ball that's off left and right of the plate. So width wise, trying to right. call a true zone there. And, uh, you know, the rule books obviously evolved a bit with wanting the higher strike. I think it's the toughest one to get and get consistently. Pitchers Absolutely. don't really throw it up there consistently. It's not necessarily a money pitch. Right. Well, and you're you're seeing more high strikes because of technology and spin rate and guys saying higher spin rate should throw at the top of the zone. But, but it's just not a good pitch for our level. We don't want to reward the top of the zone, but we're trying to throw the bottom of the zone. But it is changing with the game and that there's a lot of guys that are throwing to the top because of spin rate. I don't think our skill set at this level is there yet, but there's some that can do that. So it's a kind of a cash twenty two. Yeah, um, Bob, again, uh, just in wrapping up, uh, our conversations over the years have been um, um, very forthright, whether in the dugout uh, preseason or in, in the middle of a game. Um, I, I've always appreciated your direct um, communication, but also your ability to let an umpire work. Uh, do you find that that is something that uh, you have to focus on? You still recognize with any disagreement you may have or difference of opinion, still the um, importance of the umpire being able to work. Can you just say a little bit about that? Talk yeah, I think this, this this level has helped me appreciate it more. And it's a maturity too. When you're getting a little older and been around enough games, uh, mm -hmm. you've seen enough to know that, you know, and I tell the kids all the time, there's no umpire in the world that's ever affected the game because there's about 500 plays um, that we could do on our side that changes the tempo of the game and that helps with the understanding of that as well so i enjoy it i mean it's part of the game and i, and I enjoy it and there's no reason to to model that inconsistency and ragging and all that stuff because the kids are going to do the same thing and it's and our kids are changing as athletes so that's really important that we do it right so and, and i think you've seen better decorum with the coaches and the umpires that's because you guys have done a good job developing that relationship with them. Yeah, great input on that. Um, last question I've got for you, Bob, is just kind of if we could talk about the game from a business level a little bit. So mm -hmm. just st state of the game from your perspective. You've, you've been around junior college a long time, been involved with the high school ranks. What's the state of, of the player psyche right now in terms of how you communicate with your kids, how we should and shouldn't communicate with your student athletes? I mean, I can say in the last three years, it certainly was a direct result of COVID. Uh, the kids are a lot more front runners than usual. Uh, that's good and bad. So, uh, and they're pretty sensitive. They're pretty sensitive kids. That, that that tough little gritty kid is harder to find. So when an umpire barks, and just maybe in the state of competition, uh, you may see a defensive reaction from the kids. And that's just the nature of where their psyche is right now. And it's unfortunate, but it's reality. It's reality everywhere with kids. I saw in the high schools. So tone is key. Tone is key and, and more of a, a nurturing tone will help. Got it. I love that. Uh, we talked a bit during our last meeting about verbal and nonverbal cues. So if we can mm -hmm. be kind of maybe motioning hitters into the box as opposed to pointing and being very yep. emphatic, maybe that's an opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. You know, when you make a call like a buck or something, it doesn't have to be I mean, the kids are defensive. So if it's like, Bach, you're over there, let's go. The kids go, and they'll immediately tense up and get defensive, and they can change the tone of everything. So but we yeah, do it as coaches. I mean, Rick and I talk about it all the time about we have to check each other's tone because the days of getting, you know, my old school days are not really available anymore. And it's okay. <laughs> we, we have to adjust just well like said. the players have to adjust. So I do have one thing to add that I wanted to bring up. Please. And I think it's super important with, especially this time of year, with with lighting, with light issues into the games and inclement weather. I think if we can 
express to all our umpires that you are in control of that. There is the coaches have no say whatsoever because I see some younger umpires can be intimidated by another coach or or bullied into making a decision that's not safe because when that game starts, it's on the umpire, the safety of the kids, and it's their call and, and there's no indecision and there's no input. And that, that I think that's super important, uh, especially especially with wet weather and dark. I mean, the game will resume. We're fine with that. Uh, but they need to be reminded that it's your game when it starts. The coaches have no say. That's coming from a coach. So that's that's a great <laughs> reminder, Bob. Thank you. Phone calls like this uh, go a long way yeah. to developing, like you say, the relationship for our membership to look um, and hear from your perspective uh, what good looks like. Uh, you've shared some real good insights. Um, your experience is is uh, valued, and the intention of this Zoom call um, with the leadership, Dan's leadership, to push us a step forward every opportunity is to uh, share this with our membership and and get them to hear from a coach's perspective um, what what good looks like, where we have places to improve, and I I appreciate your your time and your and your honesty. I just want to say thank you both. Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate the opportunity to do this.